whistle while you work. Hitler was a jerk. Mussolini bit his beanie. Now it's. Or does it? Wow. Talk about a trip down memory lane. This is incredible to be here. I spent so much time here back in the day, like in the late 80s and early 90s, listening to so many bands. Basically, if they played hard rock, they probably recorded here. If they were super mega star selling artists, they were recording here. I'm referring to Little Mountain Sound, which is a world famous recording studio. Come on, it's okay. Follow me. It's fine. Here's the kitchen. There's a big table here. Who knows what could have happened in here? Does anybody have a credit card? Oh, man, it's number <laughs> I'm sure there was uh, a couple of moments here that we can't really share with you because they would be very X-rated, very X-rated. But the music did happen here. It was magical. Let's just say it was probably a whole lot of fun. I'm sure that fridge wasn't filled with milk and tea. I'm Mike Price, this is my YouTube channel. We're on a mission to solve the mystery of what happened to Credit Pool, the greatest Seattle grunge band that you've never heard of. Joining us today on this episode is Mike Fraser, the world-renowned producer and engineer of bands like ACDC, Poison, Motley Crue, Bon Jovi. Just Google them, you'll see a very impressive resume. He's gonna share with us some of his, you know, more intimate moments, some inspirations, and some of the artists and other producers that he's worked with. And it's all the magic is gonna happen right over here in this room, which is Studio B from Little Mountain Sound. Here we are with Mike Fraser. Yeah, man. In the flesh, <laughs> how are you, Mike? Oh, it's been great, it's been doing good. Damn. I, I, I don't even know when the last time we saw each other was. And here's the crazy part. It was probably right here. It could, very well could have been. In this studio. Studio B at the old Little Mountain Sound. Which is where we are right now. Yeah, which man. Which is probably one of the most famous recording studios in the world. Mm. Definitely in Canada. Definitely in Canada, and Definitely yes. one of them in North America. Yeah. I mean... Like, uh, what are some of the bands you worked with here? I mean, it. it I read your list, and it's pretty well. <laughs> who haven't you worked with is easier oh, to list. Man, I mean, yeah, you've got yeah. a very impressive resume. We, we had a good, we had a good run there for a while. You know, it. Uh, you know, probably kicked off with Loverboy got international success, and that brought in more bands. But you know, there's been Bon Jovi, AC/DC, Aerosmith was another big one here. Uh, Coverdale Page, Blue Murder. Uh, Dan Reed, I mean, you know, bang, 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 you know, through the 80s, <laughs> it was like nonstop. So it's like, it was like a blur, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can't even remember back that far. I mean, um, I remember back in the day, obviously, like, you know, back when I worked at Club Soda, I remember the, the routine was, you know, the bands would come in here, they'd record like, you know, all through the day and into the evening and whatnot. And then after a hard day's work, Bam, down to Club Soda, yep. looking for party favors, yep. strippers, yep. or jamming on the stage, just kind of showing up. Like, I remember Aerosmith did that one night, yep. and uh, Tony Franklin, the guys from Blue Murder, they just show up, and whatever band was playing there, that night they go, uh, yeah, we're the guys from, uh, you know, Poison. Do you mind if we play your gear or jam with you guys? Who's going to say no? Yeah, exactly. Well, we kind of treated it as our living room. So when we were done work here, you know, we'd try and time it. So it was like midnight-ish, you know, a little after midnight, down to the living room for a couple of pops and see what happened for the rest of the night. <laughs> so, And I remember yeah. a few nights, more often than not, after everybody was well lubricated, it'd be like, you know, somebody's idea would be, hey, well, let's go back to the studio and listen to what we did today. <laughs> yeah. And then we'd come back here with a bunch of people and we'd stay here till the sun came up just listening to, you know, what incredible music was, you know, produced that day. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, also, you know, something that I think is very instrumental to, you know, the, the scene here was our connection with Seattle. Yeah. I mean, Seattle was very close. Yeah. Um, you know, Seattle, for example, you know, that's where that whole, you know, they had their own, their own explosion, if you will. Yeah. They had the grunge 
explosion and those type of bands in the late eighties and early nineties, while we had a recording yeah. sort of bang in Vancouver. Yeah. You know, we didn't have our own scene where we were exporting music, but we were importing all the artists, you know, to come to Vancouver and to record. So that's kind of what put Vancouver on the map. Right. Did yeah. you um, work with many Seattle bands or have the opportunity? Well, it was funny because everything here seemed to kind of peak right around Expo 86. Well, the band, everything kind of peaked. Then it was that, was it 87, 88, when the Seattle explosion started happening. So it almost was like it imploded and it just, and everything kind of started sliding a little bit more south across the border. So. Uh, I remember, oh man, it was so long ago, but I remember there, I, there was this band, uh, Bellingham, or just somewhere this side of, of Seattle, down across the line, uh, wanted me to come down and do some demos or something with them. So I remember going down there, and it was, and this is before GPS or cell phones, right? So I had this <laughs> stupid address, right? To get across the border, freaking driving down there. I'm like, okay, turn here and turn at the red barn and whatever. So, <laughs> so I go down, finally find Ten place. paces from the tractor. Yeah, finally find this place and and pull up and, and it's just like a shithole kind of farm kind of thing. And I'm like, what the, you know, I thought there'd be a studio or something here. And <laughs> anyways, they had a little rehearsal room set up in one of the outbuildings or something. And, and uh, they had some old uh, sort of TAC tape machine things or whatever. So went in and, you know, they, they kind of played a few songs through and just remember a lot of drinking and <laughs> getting pretty screwed Now you're up. referring to Credit Pool, right? That's the band, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I've been doing some investigative work myself on this band, Credit Pool, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what happened to them because, yeah. you know, they were around uh, in Seattle around the same time uh, as, you know, Mother Love Bone yeah. and, you know, yeah. and uh, Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, Nirvana, uh, you know, who get all the credit, deservedly so, mm -hmm. you know, for being instrumental in grunge. But what I find fascinating is bands like Credit Pool. Yeah and Credit Pool themselves. There was lots of those bands. Yeah. Like over yeah. the years yeah. that, you know, were, you know, trying to make a name for themselves, trying to get going. And uh, I mean, it must have been incredible. I mean, to have that experience with a band like that. I mean, that's just like so off the wall. How did you find working with the singer Silas Marks? Well, you know, like I said, it's weird. It's so long ago and it was just one of those kind of off things that, you know, you never thought anything like oh my god these guys are going to be huge it wasn't one of those things i'm just down and down in the states up in the middle of nowhere in a barn these, these <laughs> things down by the river yeah <laughs> and uh, uh the guy was freaking awesome but you know kind of he was off he was like weird <laughs> <laughs> you know he was just was he, was he high or was he probably from what i remember like you know i just remember drinking a lot of beer but i don't know what else was going on down there but <laughs> you know not a lot of work got done but it was really vibey so what was done was really cool and then there'd be a lot of in between bullshit and lighting up joints freaking doing whatever that you know it was uh it was a crazy night uh, now now i remember thinking I ain't driving home tonight. <laughs> I remember thinking that. <laughs> but, uh, so it was pretty well a live thing. Like it was a commando thing where you, yeah. you parachute in, you go in, you record You're behind the band. The, behind the lines. <laughs> behind enemy lines, you know, dodging bullets. Here's this little green Canadian kid down here in this scene that was just, just then starting to blow up. So you I mean, were pretty young. It had blown up at that point, so you didn't really know. So looking back on it retrospectively, you're like, Man, I wish I could remember more of what went on there and whatever happened to the the music. Like, you know, I didn't take any cassettes or copies of it. Just went down there, you know, recorded, you know, basically some demos or rehearsal kind of vibe, and then nothing more came of it. It was one of those things that, you know, a similar connection with the Mother Love Bone guys got a tape cassette given to me and say, oh, you know, you, you want to work with these guys at some point. Oh, this is kind of cool. And then that kind of disappeared. I think the band, you know, then split up, but then fractioned off into other bigger bands. So, Pearl but Jam. that was the scene down there. Like you say, there was uh, hundreds of these, these cool little bands that had different members that eventually joined together. And then when that nucleus got together, it just exploded. But, you know, knowing that there's some audio out there, 
mm-hmm. is pretty fascinating because it sort of gives hope that maybe there is a document. Now, I don't know if Credit Pool, you know, looked at it the way I looked at it at the time, which was like, yeah, whatever. Like, who even knows what they saved? Like, did yeah. the master tape survive? Did they do a mix down? Did they, did they put it away somewhere safe? You know, like, they disappeared off the face of the planet. You know, yeah. those tapes could be in somebody's garage or basement or... Still you know. floating somewhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? It's like, yeah. there's, there's no way of knowing, but wouldn't it be amazing if, if those tapes were discovered? Like, I know, and then thinking back, on it, like, I don't know why I didn't walk out of that experience with at least made myself a cassette of it, which I did on so many things. Exactly. You just, I'll just burn me a cassette. It was so easy, like... It's so weird how things happen, yeah. though, or don't, or don't happen, right? Yeah. Well, hopefully we can dig something up. I mean, I'm, I've recently, you know Todd Kearns, right? Yeah. yeah Plays yeah, with Slash. Yeah. And... So I was interviewing him, and he actually found a photograph. Well, he didn't find it. His girlfriend, an ex-girlfriend of his, was at a show where Punchy, the guitar player from Credit Pool, was playing at the Roxy, I think. Yeah. So... His gal was a bit of an amateur photographer. She took a picture. And after the show, Punchy said, hey, you know, send me those pictures. So she, he wrote down his address on the back of something. You know, just an you know, here's my address. Turned out it was his mom's house in Seattle. Oh, uh, uh, wow. Uh-huh. So Todd sent me the photograph. And I'm hoping to go down to Seattle when the veil of COVID is lifted and see if I can't find... Uh, you know, these tapes, because knowing that you recorded these mm. guys is just incredible. Yeah. It gives it gives me a little bit of a, a, a boost to try to, you know, I've got a clue that I've got to work on that I've got to try to find. Maybe there's a closet in the basement that's got... So, you know, do you think that Credi Pool, I mean, I know that you only spent a very brief period of time mm-hmm. recording them and, you know, mm-hmm. it sounds like it was a real wild night. Mm-hmm. So you probably got to know them a little bit. Do you think they had any elements or any potential to achieve anything? I thought they were dripping it. Really? Uh, the, you know, rock star, but not in the sense of mainstream, you know, like Nickelback and, you know, those kind of bands, but dripping in like the Ian Asprey type, more punk underground thing, but definitely New York Dolls, you, you know what I mean? Like kind of they they would have caught on in that underground thing and, and gotten very big. So it's a really... We're still speaking their name. Yeah, I know. Isn't you that know? crazy? 30 years later. I mean, it's... My fingers crossed mm-hmm. that, you know, I'm going to unearth something. I'm going to dig it up. And you know mm-hmm. the first person I'm going to phone. Mm-hmm. Right? Yep. <laughs> I'm going to call you. I'm going to go, Mike, you're not going to believe this. Crazy. I found these wow. guys, right? And wouldn't it be great to, like, you know, get the tapes and remix them? And Well, you know what? You're uncovering a great mystery. Right. Here, which is becoming more and more fascinating. Like, every little clue you think, aha, here's a lead, but all that leads to is another mystery. Right. You know, like, it's well, like, just our discussion now is like, oh, so... You did do a little bit of recording with them down in some old farmhouse thing. Like, so there must be something else somewhere. You know, like each one kind of branches off to another little thing. So it's going to be very interesting to see what uh, what else you could dig up. It's been great chatting to you. I mean, yeah, it, 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 it's been like a, a trip down memory lane. Yep. Uh, you know, very educational and informative. And, uh, you know, I wish you all the best. I hope that things come back, come back yeah, with a vengeance. Cool. And I, kn- I know that it doesn't matter what happens. I know that you're going to be happening. Mm-hmm. You're going to be mm-hmm. making magic with bands and changing their lives and yeah. their careers and providing great sounds for the people of the world. So, Mike. Yeah, man. Thank you so much, buddy. <laughs> all right, we'll see <laughs> you again. Awesome. Yeah, and keep me uh, up posted on any of the cuddy pool stuff i will I'm definitely now completely fascinated and i wish i wish i had more brain cells working on the, <laughs> what happened <laughs> together we're gonna find out awesome. what happened to cuddy pool the greatest grunge band that you've never heard of that's right adios youtube <laughs> see you mike yeah that was great <laughs> so good awesome <laughs>